Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Shots with Soldiers. This is our 12th episode, and we're really excited to have a special guest with you today. As we, uh, uh, as I introduce my, my guests, I want to tell you a little bit about her. So host Valerie Fortney is a 30-year veteran of newspaper, magazine, and radio business. For, for 20 years, she was an editor and then columnist with the Calgary Herald work that took her around the world. She, her feature writing has appeared internationally through publications like Ch Chatelaine and the Los Angeles Times and Reader's Digest, Digest International. Her tenure at the Calgary Herald was quite an uh, electric one. For a time she ran uh, the lifestyle section, which saw her reporting at uh, such lighter events as Los Angeles and New York Fashion Week. It was in 2001, while attending the New York Fashion Week, that her career took a 180 uh, turn. She was on the scene as the terrorist attacks unfolded at the World Trade Centers on September 11, 2001. She was the first Canadian jur journalist to report live from the disaster and stayed a week after the tragedy to chronicle the human fallout. Uh, her work garnered a National Newspaper Award nomination for breaking news. Uh, a few years later, she was part of a, a small team investigating a dowry scams in India, work that brought her and her team members two international awards, the Daniel Pearl Award from New York's Columbia University and the Commonwealth Writers Union based in the United Kingdom. In 2011, Valerie's first book, Sunray, The Death and Life of Cap Captain Nicola Goddard was published to widespread critical acclaim and was long listed for the BC Book Award, the most lucrative non-fiction writing award in Canada. Her story not only celebrated the life of Canada's first female combat certified soldier to die in combat in, in battle, but also introduced to many Canadians the complex decisions that go into deciding the life as a soldier. After the book's publication, Valerie traveled to Afghanistan at the invitation of the National the Department of National Defense, an experience that gave her a window into the day-to-day -day, uh, sacrifices and the risks that members of the Canadian military take as they perform their duties. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Valerie. Thank you so much for doing this on Thank short you. notice. Uh, we're really excited for your, uh, your, your presentation and I will mute myself so you can begin your presentation. Okay. Okay. How long do I talk for about like 20 minutes or about 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. 15? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Oh gosh. It's been a while since I've, you know, had to do presentations. So a uh, little, little nervous, but uh, I do know a lot about the story of, of Captain Nicola Goddard and uh, uh, as Bruce, is, as you noted in my um, uh, introduction, I, I, I basically uh, started my career out uh, in the business or was continuing my career in the business, trying to write about the lighter things in life, food, fashion, travel, uh, fun lifestyle. Um, I, I've lost two siblings in um, tragic circumstances when I was young. Younger, and I, I really had no interest in hard news. Uh, but uh, you know, imagine being in New York on 9/11, watching the you know the buildings go down. Um, I turned out changed my life, changed my career. Uh, I was reporting live to Kevin Newman uh, when he was on uh, when he was anchoring Global National. I I, I went from writing about fashion in. 24 hours to being the first Canadian journalist on the ground uh, in New York. Uh, needless to say, mine wasn't the only life that changed um, uh, on that day. Uh, you know, it, it really set, uh, it was the first moment that set in the wheels in motion for the Afghanistan war, the Afghan mission. And uh, so many young people, um, much younger than I, uh, were, uh, you know, either in the military or wanting to join the military. And this whole new world, this whole new experience, a decade long war was um, uh, is what they were going to be meeting. And, uh, you know, and Captain Nicola Goddard was one of those young people who, who you know, watched 
the, the and knew uh, watched those buildings go down and she knew that her 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 life and career was go was going to change too like so many soldiers and uh, I, even though I appear to be like probably the, I would have been the from my biographies the last person to write about the military and uh, and uh, a soldier's story uh, it, it it came about when I when I came back from New York and of course was uh, guided gently into doing more um, hardcore news uh, analysis, uh, column writing, uh, things that took me all over the place. Uh, it, it was uh, a pretty uh, exciting time for me, but it was also a pretty tragic time because that's when the uh, casualties started to come in. So, of course, I was uh, the columnist on the beat of when uh, a, another soldier died is to tell their story. And the way that uh, uh, Nicola's story came to me, uh, Nicola never uh, lived in uh, Calgary and uh, never lived in Alberta, which was the one uh, curious thing uh, about the fact that uh, Alberta, she she was Alberta's story at the beginning. And um, uh, even though she lived all over the country and in other parts of the world, it was because her parents were here and her father, uh, an educator and academic at the University of Calgary. and uh, I, uh, I just was reporting and doing one story on the death of uh, Canada's first uh, uh, female combat certified soldier to um, die in battle and uh, got to know them a bit. I uh, kept having to do stories. Um, and of course, uh, everyone knows the Goddards are pretty, uh, are pretty high profile there in those early years and uh, got to know them. And they were actually the ones that first broached the subject about, you know, uh, wouldn't this be a great story to tell? And the more I got to know the family and the more I got to know Nicola's story, her life of uh, basically traveling all around the world, growing up as a little girl, first learning how to use a baby size machete in Papua New Guinea by the tribes women. It was, uh, it was an exotic story. And the further I delved, uh, speaking with Tim, uh, meeting uh, Nicola's uh, widower, uh, Jay, and uh, the family bringing out treasure trove of letters. And so there was really what Nicola had done in by sharing all her experiences with the people she loved the most was give this vibrant 3D portrait of, of a Canadian soldier like we haven't seen in decades, uh, you know, a combat uh, situation. And uh, she was eloquent. She was a, a beautiful writer. She um, was very romantic with her husband and yet firm and tough with the, with her guys, uh, you know, that she, uh, that she commanded. Uh, she also, um, um, I'm sorry, just leave my tra train of thought for a second there. Still nervous about uh, doing video stuff. <laughs> uh, she, she, not only in those letters, but she did. She she often debated with yes. her mother about. Ooh, sorry, oh, she debated, <laughs> somebody's got their mic on. Um, she debated with her father uh, uh, back and forth about you know uh, soldiering versus diplomacy, and so what she did was she left this incredible legacy of uh, opening up to a much wider. Uh, audience of Canadians to understand the soldier experience and also the intricacies and complexities and sometimes absurdities of the planning uh, and execution of Canada's mission. And uh, so she gave us this great legacy. And also, um, you know, she, she, she didn't want to be known as the first female, the first female. That was something she was out there to defy stereotypes and, um, and uh, show that women could be on the battlefield as well. Uh, and she did have some firsts, you know, and I was, I was just reviewing my book again, um, to remind myself, you know, on like on that day, she was, uh, she was uh, the first, uh, her food team was the first to execute a high explosion and eliminated fire mission for the first time uh, against a known enemy since the Korean War. So that was pretty uh, 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 record breaking, and it was history making. And um, she she uh, also uh, when she was leading with Jeff Fair and they were the first they were the frontline leaders in the first close quarter combat experienced by Canadian soldiers in nearly half a century. So and that unfortunately was ha on the day she died and uh, 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 her her story, when I started to pursue this story and opened up, for, fortunately, because I had the blessing of her immediate family, I was able to speak to uh, her, the men and her colleagues and, and uh, from 
the the people that took orders from her right up to her commanding officers and higher ups they they saw her as a, as someone to be uh, respected uh, she was really well liked and respected at the same time uh, she was tough but fair um, and I and she was just um, she was all all through her career she was. Um, People, she stood out, they, and they really thought she would become a, a, you know, a future, a future leader in in the military. And um, and when she died, unfortunately, you know, through her death, uh, she is known as the first female. Um, something she would not have loved, but um, it, it did send it did send ripples once again. Her legacy at work again. Uh, it had it woke a lot of people up in Canada to the fact that. Uh, we were putting our soldiers in harm's way in, in very dangerous situations that uh, we weren't just no longer the blue beret wearing uh, Canadian peacekeepers. Uh, it woke a lot of people up to what was going on. And I just feel really privileged to have told this story because of, of all of the amazing things about her, but also the fact that because she was so literary, because she was so prolific in her writings, uh, that we were, I was able to, uh, as a layperson, bring this human story to the forefront. If there's any way to make people understand and appreciate the soldier experiences, to have that kind of beautiful, uh, eloquent letter writing, and 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 just, you know, she basically, after her death, told her story. So. I think that's about all I have to say, uh, you know, and uh, uh, about just that she showed the best of soldiers. She defied a lot of stereotypes already of what uh, uh, the soldier experience was and what, when we think of a Canadian soldier, what, what, what do we visualize? I think that was about all I was going to say, Bruce. Okay. Okay. <laughs> did I, thank, did I... thank you. No, no, no. That's perfect. Is that so okay? We're gonna, okay. We're going to go to gallery view and we're going to turn on our, our oh, videos. Oh, good. Now I can see people again. Okay. <laughs> Rather than looking at my own face. <laughs> and I'm going to do a shot of Telemore Dew, an Irish <laughs> whiskey. And okay. I'm I'm going to do a shot to, to Captain Nicola Goddard. Oh, yeah. I've got some wine here, too. <laughs> Well, that was that was wonderful. That was great. Oh, thank um, you. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Can I ask a question, please? Go ahead, Paul. Um, Valerie, I'm sorry I have not read your book, and I probably will not read the book because I've just got so many things that I <laughs> I will be reading. So I, of course, know the uh, the newspaper story of Nicola but I don't know beyond that. So would you mind, you've talked about her going all around the world. I don't know how that occurred. I would like to know a bit about the person and how she ended up in the military. Would you mind doing that? Or oh, sure. That uh, well, I can uh, give... Buying the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you read the book, you'd get this whole story. I know. <laughs> well, well, Nicola, her, her, her parents were... Um, her father was from Canada. Her mother was from England. They were both um, educators, and uh, uh, I, Sally had joined. I believe it was. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forget. It was one of those kind of you know organizations um, that take you kids CUSO, I think it was. And so she was working as um, an academic there as a teacher. And Tim came, and he called himself, I think, it was a mercenary educator or something, because he he basically just came for the opportunity of something. Um, uh, something exotic part of the world and they met there they um, they ended up helping to build the very first school on the island where they were educators um, actually I went back to Papua New Guinea with uh, her parents um, uh, just as I was writing the book and they were uh, they were greeted as basically visiting royalty and you've never seen anything like this in your life but it was such an honor to be with her family. They did ceremonial, funeral dances, everything in 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 honor of Nicola. Um, even you know the the her 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 daycare providers, you know her her nannies that on the island even remembered her so clearly. And when they came back, because Tim 
wasn't a, a, an academic. He ended up going uh, and and serving and working um, in all different parts of Canada. He, you know, so after Papua New Guinea, they were in London just for a short time, and then they came to Canada and they were in uh, uh, First Nations uh, reserves up in northern Saskatchewan. They lived in Edmonton for a time, um, Nova Scotia. Um, they kind of bounced all over Canada, the family. And so Nicola kind of lived in just about every part of Canada. So that was her upbringing. She had both parents very well educated, um, self-described pacifists. Uh, were quite, uh, she was one of these young women, young girls who was super athletic, but also really uh, uh, good at school, uh, high marks, um, was going places in life. And in grade 12, I believe it was, she dropped the bombshell to her parents that she was going to sign up at Royal Military College for an education and an adventure. So that's how she first got into it. Uh, she met her, her husband at Royal Military College and uh, they ended up uh, relocating to CFB Shiloh. And through the book, I tell the story basically of her falling in love with the military, um, uh, decide, deciding she was gonna be a lifer and, uh, and leading up. And so she and her father debated vigorously back and forth and I mean, I only, I only was able to use a snippet of those letters uh, to her husband, to her father, to her mother. Um, and she was just extremely thoughtful. And, and, and I remember um, uh, them, her and her father just going back and forth like, that, you know, I do what I do, you know, and you do what you do. And I have to, what I do, sometimes you can't do. You know, something to that effect. I'm sorry, I forgot the beautiful quote that she had uh, had made uh, about that. So it was just, I did have people say to me, oh, why did you write? Did you just write about her because she was the first female? And I said, well, no, it was, it was much more organic process than that. When someone, especially a family comes to you and may I just say they were the most amazing family and I'm still in touch with them today. And I had total artistic and license to tell the story in the way I, I felt it should be told. And I really, what I really wanted to do with that story was something that military people could pick up and not find a bunch of errors and appreciate her story. But maybe, you know, a teenage girl would want to read it because- oh, I'm just going to cook this. I've... No, go ahead. So I was just, that's where I was going to, I was just going to end that comment was um, she really had a very uh, diverse, upbringing and a well-educated one and represents a lot of Canadian families. And, and I'm not in the military. I understand my, my father was a, a World War II vet. So, you know, I know a little bit about that, but that, that period of his life was before I was born. Um, but most Canadians uh, do not have a real clear picture of today's soldier and today's military. And I think that's w one of the gifts that she left. Can I, can I follow up with one question or am I going to interrupt? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Um, one further question out of that, because I, I recognize that actually the, the irony, of course, is that the, the strongest pacifist is the person that has seen what the military must do, but, um, or mm -hmm. has been in the military. But the question that I wanted to really follow up with, you mentioned her and a couple of first, something first uh, since since uh, Korea, the first, mm -hmm. uh, the incident in which she died. Would you mind amplifying that a little bit? Uh, I'm just not sure how so. Um, yeah, this is, oh, sorry, I, you know, it's been a few years since I wrote yes. the book. So I, I did go through and just kind of, you know, re-educated myself and such. But these were the things that I was told by, and of course, they were verified, right? You know, I made sure mm -hmm. that they didn't get into the book unless it was for real. And it was that as, as the uh, forward operating officer, um, she was the first Canadian soldier to execute high explosion and illuminated fire missions against a known enemy for the first time since the Korean War. And she and Captain Jeff Adair, on the day that they were leading 200 uh, uh, mostly men into battle, um, 
they were junior, there was none of the higher ranking officers were available. They were all posted different places. So they got kind of recruited by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ian Hope to uh, be the frontline leaders. So they, uh, they, it was described as them, the two of them being the first, the, the frontline leaders in the first close quarter combat experience by Canadian soldiers in nearly half a century. So I don't know a lot about military history. I just know that these facts are verified. Were, were verified by the government of Canada and other experts. Yeah. So Thanks she really, much. she was really. It really. It wasn't just because Nicola was a woman, and is you know, and that we awoke to the fact that women are in combat roles in the Canadian military. It was also that she actually on that uh, in that battle and the courage she showed to the men around her. Um, she, it was a history. It was a historic day for Canadian for Canada. Thank so, you, Valerie. You're so welcome. We have a question from Giselle. Sure. Oh, hi, Valerie. So, hi. Uh, you spoke of Nicola very highly, and I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to get the book myself to be able to look, go through it. But I was wondering what, what do you think her advice would be? Um, just gathered from what you know from her family and, and your research uh, in writing your book, what do you think her advice would be to soldiers, regardless men or women, in joining the forces today? Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a kind of a tough question. Um, I hate to put the words in the mouth of anyone, let alone a fallen soldier. Um, but I, 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 I at least, it's really hard to know if she were to know today you know, the, the fallout from the Afghan mission and differing opinions. I'm not quite sure where she would land on her decision-making process with more information. But uh, one thing I could say about her that she really loved the military life and she was very adamant that, you know, that men and women should be um, side by side fighting. And uh, she debated it to the ends of the earth with her father and she really had an educated opinion about why we need warriors so awesome, i will just thank you. thanks i'll just end this with this uh uh I, a lot of the guys here uh were, were serving at that time and uh i can specifically remember the moment that i saw that nicola had uh, had had a uh, lost her life uh i was going on the next tour and i could tell you i was on i was in the mess and i was eating breakfast and i saw the ctv news we, it was on the big screen ctv news in the morning and i remember thinking that this was not uh, you said the blue helmets and uh, this was not going to be a bosnia tour this was not going to be a walk in the park this was gonna this is the real deal and i remember thinking it really it really brought things that was the moment of clarity for me that I knew that this was no longer, you know, uh, this wasn't the romantic visions that I had of being a soldier, but this was life and death and her death brought that a lot closer to reality. Then it was a wake up call for me to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I think it was a turning point for Canada. It really was. Um, I want to thank you again for doing this, uh, for filling in for the general. As we know, uh, the general <laughs> has just finished his uh, yes his his, his, his uh, contract with the province and the uh, vaccination dispersal. This has been the twelfth episode of Shots with Soldiers with a wonderful guest. I just wanted to take the time to say, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read Sunray. Uh, the life, uh, the death and life of Nicola Goddard. This is a must read. Please go. It's on Amazon. It's a few others. Uh, Valerie, is there anywhere else that we can? Well, you know what? Yeah, unfortunately, the book uh, publisher went out bankrupt uh, afterwards. Oh. You know, I'm bad luck for everybody. But um, you can get Kindle editions on Amazon, okay. I do believe. And um, uh, I thought that the Goddard Foundation had a, a link. People can check that. I'm not 100% sure. Sorry, I should have checked that beforehand. Um, but uh, yeah, it is available, a Kindle edition on Amazon. And it, um, you're not going to be disappointed. This is great, guys. So um, a little bit about you guys, just to tell you guys about the Valor Project. It's coming along. We have uh, uh, just gotten to 12,000 people on our social media. We've got a business number. 
and we're going to start uh, uh, raising money for our next project, uh, Valor in the Presence of the Enemy. We're going to be looking at putting out some documentaries and trying to get that VC for an Afghanistan veteran, which is something I think that uh, Captain Nicola Goddard uh, would uh, would be a uh, proudly uh, represent. I don't want to put words in her mouth as well, but mm -hmm. I think this is a cause that we all can Definitely. get behind and uh, that we want to make sure that these stories, Nicola's story, Sean's story, uh, Jess's story, all our stories get out there and get told so that Canadians can hear the amazing things that uh, happened over there and the amazing things that happened in the past. So on behalf of Valor in the Presence of the Enemy, thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, our first, second host or repeat host in Dr. David O'Keefe. This has been another edition. Thank you and uh, have a great weekend, guys.